Hello, I'm your host, Brian Callanan. What are the city council's expectations for new police chief Adrian Diaz? How will investments in a Green New Deal impact your neighborhood and our climate? And how will Seattle deal with a $117 million budget deficit? Council members Lisa Herbold and Teresa Mosqueda join me to talk about these questions and the ones you're sending in too, next on Council Edition. And we need to figure out how we can make sure that these life-saving services are still able to be delivered. When a legislative branch passes law, when we put funding into the budget, we expect there to be implementation. All that and more coming up next on City Inside Out, Council Edition. And here we are, everyone, back in the studio for this program for the first time in more than two years. And I'm very happy to welcome Councilmember Lisa Herbold from the District 1, where I'm in, West Seattle here. Thank Great you. to have you here. Also, Councilmember Teresa Mosqueda, Citywide Position 8. Thank you very much for being here. It means a lot to me to have you here in person. And as fellow West Seattleites, <laughs> I'm seeing that, that glow of uh, feeling the bridge back open. That, that's Indeed. a good thing, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Palpable. Yeah, you can feel it. You can feel it. I'll, I'll jump right to it. Uh, Councilmember Herbal, I want to start with uh, your role in the, on public safety, and, and you chair that committee. So the job ahead, holding confirmation hearings for the mayor's pick for a new police chief, which would be our interim chief, Adrian Diaz. First, your thoughts on the mayor's selection, if you could, and then talk about this confirmation process. It's a very important proj project here, committee meetings, et cetera, but it's going to be happening during a budget season when the council usually doesn't have those kind of meetings. So sure. how's this going to work? And, and your thoughts about Chief Diaz to start. Sure. Well, I've really um, appreciated the opportunity to serve on the mayor's search committee and really um, value the time and energy that other search committee members devoted to this process. Also really appreciate the public process, uh, some of which you helped out I with. did, yeah, <laughs> at, at, at meeting with all three candidates. Thank you. Yeah, it was very interesting. Um, as it relates specifically to um, uh, the confirmation process, yeah. we are likely going to wait until after budget. I see. Interim chief has been in the role for 24 months. I see. He can continue serving as interim for another couple months until we're through the budget okay. process is the plan. Thank you for updating yeah, me on that sure. piece of it. Councilman Mosqueda, I wanted to draw on your experience as budget chair here because you're looking right ahead at this over the next month or so and just a budget issue connected to SPD. I remember last year during the budget process, there was this push to try to take the money saved in salaries when the SPD didn't reach its hiring goals, put that towards other public safety priorities. It's looking like the SPD will not reach its hiring goals again this year. So I'm trying to figure out what do you want to see happen with those excess dollars? Well, for the last two years that I've been budget chair, every single individual who SPD thought they could hire received the funding from this council. This council has stood with the hiring plan to ensure that we funded the ask that the department had asked for. However, we were not interested in having millions of dollars sit in a coffer for the possibility of a retention number that could not be met. Again, we don't see that retention number being met this year round, and I anticipate that we will receive a budget that has uh, higher than possible retention number planned. We are going to continue on with what the council passed, I believe led by Council Member Herbold, uh, to make sure that we're investing in retention and hiring strategies. But also, as we consider our budget, I want to make sure that every dollar that is available that we know could today go to important services upstream like housing, health services, um, caring for our most vulnerable, that we deploy those dollars. So I think we'll continue to right size those investments, continue supporting the hiring plan, and where there is pockets that look like they may be unspent, uh, we may proviso those and see what else we can do with those dollars in the meantime. Okay, thanks for the preview there. And maybe I can take this conversation down this path following up with public safety, specifically the idea of building up some alternative responses for 911 calls. The mayor's office has presented a term sheet to the council here outlining this plan to create a framework for these alternate responses by the end of the year, actual pilot of program next year. Councilmember Herbold, I know you're doing a lot of work behind the scenes on this. Tell us what's going on if you can and, and why you're working on this too. Sure. So um, the department, the police department is going through an analysis called uh, a risk managed demand right. analysis. And that's based on um, last year's Nick Jr. report mm -hmm. that identified uh, uh, an estimate on a percentage of calls that could be handled by a non-sworn police response. Mm -hmm. The risk demand analysis looks at how calls were 
resolved, not just how they were originally classified, to determine whether or not there is a risk for particular call types to be sent elsewhere. Because this work is work that um, is going to be continuing through 2023, um, this analysis. Um, we are going to get a preview of it um, in committee, uh, the Public Safety and Human Services Committee this week. Mm -hmm. um, we felt really strongly, we on the council felt really strongly that we needed to do a pilot right. on a particular number of call types. I could just pick a couple types, okay. like person down, mm -hmm. wellness checks. Yes, okay. And let's just do a pilot response, alternate response with just those calls while they do the risk analysis for the hundreds of other I call see. types. Okay. Okay. Um, and I was in a position of um, reporting back to in my committee on sort of the progress on the um, on the larger analysis and kept telling my colleagues, telling the public we're on the verge of working together with mm -hmm. the executive mm -hmm. on um, identification of goals and timelines, but I didn't really have a product. Yeah. And so this idea of the term sheet would sort of mem memorialize yeah. our shared goals. Okay. And we're hoping um, to really get something up and running uh, early 2023. And uh, maybe Councilmember Mosqueda, I can bring you in here. What do you want to see out of an alternate 911 type of program? I'd like to see the programs that we invested in deployed. I'd like yeah. to see the funding that we allocated over the last two years implemented. I appreciate that um, our lead on public safety, Chair Herbold, has worked on a term sheet with this new administration, but you asked what it symbolizes. What does this mean for the future? I think it symbolizes the effort to try to create trust, again, between the executive and the legislative branch, but I also hope it symbolizes and signals to future administrations that when a legislative branch passes law, when we put funding into the budget, we expect there to be implementation. What I hope that this signals to future administrations is that when a law is passed, there will be follow-up to ensure that those dollars are deployed. We are doing this work right now, led by Councilmember Herbold, with the good partnership of this new administration, the Herald administration, because of the past failures of the Durkin administration. They did not deploy the funding that we allocated. They failed to implement the strategies for alternative 911 policing mm -hmm. um, efforts. And so here we we are trying to rebuild trust, not only between branches of government, but with the public to show that there will be future action. Uh, I am hopeful that yeah. this is a strong indication that the past policies and Pat's approach to ignoring statute and ignoring funding mm -hmm. will not continue, um, no matter who is in these seats. Councilmember Mosqueda, back to you for some thoughts about the Green New Deal that the mayor just signed into law, $6.5 million towards that program. Where's the investment going, and how does the city get to that big goal of getting all the city buildings off of using fossil fuels fuels by the year 2035 because that's coming right up. Yeah, thank you so much for flagging this. This is $6.5 million that's coming directly from the Jumpstart Progressive Revenue Investment. I want to applaud uh, the council from 2020 and 2021, who not only passed progressive revenue, the highest progressive revenue policy we've ever seen into statute, but collectively, unanimously, we codified the spend plan. Part of the spend plan was to make sure that at least 9% of the funding went into Green New Deal investments. So I want to give the total number for this year. Okay. For the year 2022, the total number of Green New Deal investments is 14.5 million. Next year it will be near 20 million, the year after that over 20 million. And so when we look at 6.5, I just wanted to put that into context of the larger investments that we're making. The reason 6.5 million is important is because these priorities come directly from the community, the Green New Deal Oversight Board, who was representative of frontline uh, workers, frontline workers in industries that see higher levels of toxins and pollutants in their um, in their work sector, mm -hmm. and fence line communities, mm -hmm. folks like the folks that we visit in, in Duwamish Valley yep. in South Park, right. um, who have more proximity to freeways and high pollution um, industry and, and traffic ways. So mm -hmm. This body really came up with the recommendations. It's going to go into creating greater safeguards for buildings so that people have safer places to go when there's right. high levels of smoke, heat, and cold. Yeah. Uh, it's going to make sure that we're investing in workforce so mm -hmm. that we can lead a just transition to a green new economy. And I'm really excited about the opportunity for us to create jobs as we also create a greener economy. Thank you for breaking that down. And Councilmember Herbold, talking about South Park here, it's where the mayor signed the legislation. It's in your district here. He actually made a point to say life expect expectancy is eight years shorter in that neighborhood right. than the Seattle average, which was a shocking number to me. What impact do you see this Green New Deal having on South Park and maybe the whole Duwamish Valley? There? Yeah, um, I think the work that they're planning on doing 
around resiliency hubs mm -hmm. focused on these impacted communities, communities that have been impacted for generations from the, the industry in the area for the fact that it's a super fun site um, and really trying to uh, focus these investments on um, not uh, sort of giving in to the fact that climate change is happening, mm. but really building off of the resiliency that we already see in this community. Um, and so uh, a really, resiliency hub's really exciting. I also want to just uh, shout out for the fact that um, we're having uh, some uh, AC upgrades mm -hmm. um, in our library in District 1. Oh, okay. So that's really, really great news as well um, for uh, places to go uh, when we need to cool. Yeah, cooling centers. It's and a huge piece. Might. Yeah, please. Um, a huge shout out as well to the labor partners who are part of the Green New Deal Oversight Board. Yep. One of the really exciting investments in this is making sure that we're investing in the clean heat program to get homes off of oil burning furnaces and into more greener options. Uh, folks at IBEW, for example, were mm -hmm. part of this task force. And this is not only good for the individuals in those homes, for our climate, it's also good for job creation. So it's yep. a wonderful investment. Uh, going to be very interesting to see how that rolls out. I'm going to move on to a big vote this week on the Parks District, where the City Council serves as the Parks District Board. There's a proposal to just about double the property tax levy that funds our parks. Cam council Member Mesquite, I'll start with you. I know the Council's heard some concerns about the price tag here. I'll throw one more on the pile. We had a viewer write in this. Before voting to raise our taxes and double the Parks Department budget, have you audited how they spend their money now? How much is spent on administration versus maintenance, and how does this compare to other cities? An answer, if you can, to that question as best you can. And uh, why are these extra dollars needed, I guess? Yeah. Well, I think Seattle can be very proud. We have incredible oversight over our public levies. We have spent the last few months having these deliberations in public with community, led by central staff and the department directors as well, to show exactly that, where the funding is going. What we're talking about right now, I think, amounts to just over $2.5 a week in terms of additional cost to um, our residents. And the value of that is immense. Measurable. We're talking about investments in public parks across our city. We're talking about opening up the 128 bathrooms in our city, which Erica Barnett points out <laughs> at any point in Seattle's time, only about half of those bathrooms are currently open. We know that we need restrooms, we need playgrounds, we need play spaces, green spaces, and more investments in the opportunity for people to have a livable, walkable neighborhood. As we promote density and we want more people to live in the city, those parks are our backyards. This is the places where kiddos will learn how to play, um, a walk for the first time like my kiddo did at the Delridge Community Center and at the uh, street that we closed down over in uh, Alki. Oh, yeah. We're creating public places for people to really have an enjoyable opportunity to live in this city. And so I think the value of what voters will be able to take away from these investments is going to be, as Council Member Herbal noted, investments as well in yeah. green buildings, safer places for people to go, yeah. and investments that I think we will all be able to enjoy, like trees and restrooms. Got it. Uh, Council Member Herbold, I want to make sure I focus on one part of this legislation with park rangers. Gotten a lot of headlines here. Some advocates raise concerns that these rangers would be used to conduct sweeps of homeless encampments. I want to make sure we clear the air on this topic, uh, break down what these rangers will be doing, what they won't be doing, because I think the legislation the council is looking at is very specific mm -hmm. about this. It is. So um, many years ago, a lot of uh, members of the public, advocates, um, civil rights attorneys were very, very concerned about um, the Parks Exclusion Ordinance. Yeah. So, Sidron Era Ordinance, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, my prior boss, Nick right. Cotta, we tried to amend it in uh, 1999. We were not successful. Uh, legal, um, like defense attorneys, legal advocates, uh, social service advocates succeeded in 2012 doing what we were unable to do legislatively, which was to convince the Parks Department to um, enact a, a legislative rule that constrained the park rangers' abilities to enforce the Parks Exclusion Ordinance, mm -hmm. and instead focuses uh, not on problematic people, but problematic behavior. So it allows the parks rangers to give warnings, um, but very, very, very much limits 
the instances where they can give exclusions. And those exclusions are not just for somebody who's who received a warning being back in the park, but they have to be violating a rule again. And we've seen um, how the Parks Department has really uh, embraced this focus and, sh and used it to really shift what the park rangers do. Right? It's more about making uh, the parks a welcoming place for everybody and less um, of an enforcement um, uh, emphasis. So, uh, you know, that this, this administrative rule um, is an administrative rule that was filed with the city clerk's office. It was re, um, uh, uh, restated again in 2014 and then again in 2016 when there, the council passed the park smoking ban. Right. So um, parks is all in on this approach and I don't think people have to worry about um, going back to this bad Sidron era law and I know that there are some folks um, who are interested in making a change to that law for once and for all but I'm really confident with Superintendent Williams commitment because he helped get this uh, in place in 2012, um, that this is going to be a positive way forward. Got it. Thank you for that. Uh, can I stick with you for a second? I wanted to ask about the Third Avenue Vision Plan, the council's sure. where you talk about welcoming places. Uh, there's some concern that this transit corridor isn't healthy for businesses or pedestrians. The Seattle Times called it also a persistent underground economy built around addiction and poverty. We had a viewer <laughs> write about this too. Seattle has an office vacancy rate of near 20%. Bell Bellevue has a vacancy rate near 5%. Employees don't want to work in Seattle due to crime. What's the city council doing to stop businesses from leaving? And the CBRE numbers that I saw, downtown Seattle closer to 23% vacancy, downtown Bellevue at 8%, just throwing it out there. But you <laughs> get the point. I'm trying to figure out basically this balance that you're looking at with 3rd Avenue. Making sure you have a 3rd Avenue that's good for transit, mm -hmm. but also making sure it's good for businesses yeah. there and people who want to walk yeah. there too. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really recognizing um, the fact that this is a, a street that we want to do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. It happens to be one of the most successful transit streets in the nation. Right. But in its success fulfilling that mission, um, it is de-emphasizing the sorts of eyes and ears and active use of the street um, that that are necessary just to, to have it healthy and full of lots of uses. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know one of the things that um, they've really looked at is uh, things like the sidewalk width, yep. um, you know, things that can help activate a space. Uh, one of the things I'm really focused on is making sure that while uh, embracing other uses of this public street right of way, not privatizing it, but public street right of way, mm -hmm. is um, that we don't make sacrifices on the fact that this is a transit uh, through a fair that it's a workhorse for the city and for the region. Um, so I'm really um, trying to emphasize the, the, the fact that we need to uh, identify the transit capacity needs even with light rail coming and, and make sure we don't, we have an agreement that we're not going to lose that. Got it. Uh, Council Member Mosqueda, any thoughts on yeah. 3rd Avenue? This, this is a big one. I mean, I, first, I think we need to wholeheartedly reject the notion that transit or transit riders somehow are a nuisance. When we actually increase transit and increase the capacity for individuals to be able to ride buses and wait for buses, it activates the streets. We need to be creating more opportunities for people to have safe shelters from the rain, park benches so that they can sit and wait. Today, I got off the bus and had a cup of coffee and a bagel after I got off the bus this morning and watched elders wait for the bus across the street on 3rd Avenue without a, a place to, uh, to sit and wait for the bus there. We need to make this a comfortable riding experience for everyone so that more people use transit. And when more people use transit, there will be more eyes and ears on the street, more activation and opportunity um, for people to pop into a shop and, and shop local. And we can also make sure that it's um, a beautiful place uh, with more trees, more public uh, area for people to walk, uh, supporting businesses who maybe want to have more outdoor dining. Sure. And to the degree that we can include uh, bike lanes along with transit, I'm, I'm all in. So I just want to make sure that we lift up the possibility of how we enhance ridership, how we enhance the vision of Third Avenue being a pro bus corridor and see that as a real positive for local businesses. Uh, so I think we're both in alignment with what the um, uh, TCC, the Transportation Choices Coalition, Coalition uh, Executive Director 
Director has put out there, which is we have to really be supporting and embracing transit versus seeing this as somehow an opportunity for us to mitigate transit on that corridor. Transit is our pathway towards making this street more active. Is the Downtown Seattle Association, going, they're a partner in this. I mean, they, they really were pushing for this plan. I just want to make sure that I'm clear on what, what businesses should expect out of this, because it's definitely going to be some transit down there. Yeah, I mean, I think what should be expected in the near term is sort of seating a table yeah. uh, and making sure that all of the stakeholders are at the table, um, business owners as well as transit advocates, as well as um, residents of, of, of a lot of our nonprofit uh, housing providers mm -hmm. uh, in that in that area um, who have public space needs that aren't well met. So um, I, I just think in the near term, what we're talking about is setting a table um, that will lead to a conversation about how to make that corridor um, work more effectively for all of its uses. Got and it. and okay. we're Please. in post-COVID, and it's not post-COVID, I want to remind people, we're, we're yeah. still uh, we're in the there. midst of this, but, um, and get your vaccine um, booster. That's right. Uh, we need to really think about in this moment as we are getting more accustomed to emerging from our neighborhoods and our homes, what it means to draw people downtown. It might not be that those buildings or storefronts are gonna be occupied by office space, and that's okay. We have put funding in through Jumpstart Progressive Payroll Tax to invest in economic revitalization. I know Councilmember Herbal's been a supporter of arts and culture. We can activate our public spaces and those storefronts in more creative ways. It is not necessarily a bad thing that we're second in the nation in terms of the amount of people who want to stay home and continue to do their work from home. Congratulations and applause to the employers who are encouraging and allowing people to stay home and work from there. That's probably great for their work-life balance, but we can figure out ways to activate those office spaces in new ways and do that in partnership with DSA as well. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I need to move on and I, I, I didn't save enough time for this. I want to make sure that we do a lot of uh, budget talk at the end here. Real quick on cannabis equity. Could you talk about this? Some big stuff happening here, a milestone in passing it, but it really seems like the work is just beginning on cannabis equity. Can you give us the less than a minute version if you can? Yeah. The real big takeaway is what you just said. This is just the beginning. 10 years ago, the city began being on the front line of of uh, legalizing cannabis, um, um, uh, making sure that we were not criminalizing the use of cannabis and medical marijuana. Here we are 10 years later, and we've seen other jurisdictions add into their legalization efforts an equity lens. So in partnership with what the state is doing, we are saying we are ready, we want to be a good partner, and we want to quickly deploy funding and opportunity for communities hardest hit by the war on drugs and make sure that the dollars go to small businesses and frontline workers, workers of color, who can help make that industry thrive. Thank you for breaking that down. Can you briefly talk about the work you're doing with regard to abortion protection, a really big situation you were working on with Councilmember Morales earlier this summer. Yeah. Talk about what's going on right now. Sure. So the council has recently passed um, um, several pieces of legislation. Uh, the first was sponsored by uh, Councilmember Sawant, uh, which identifies Seattle as a city that will not use its policing resources to um, enforce the laws of other states or other uh, jurisdictions um, that are in conflict with ours as far as um, abortion access. Uh, this might be seen um, as a symbolic measure, but I have noticed that there are jurisdictions all over the country that have passed similar laws. So it's it's one of those things where um, we are supporting one another and our support for uh, full access to reproductive health rights. And it's important. It's important to show that solidarity. Um, as it relates to the other bills, there are three other bills that I co-sponsored with Councilman Morales. Mm -hmm. One um, creates a protected class for people who are seeking um, full access to reproductive health care. Um, so a person can't be discriminated against. Yeah, okay. uh, another bill that we passed uh, relates to the ability of um, people to exercise their free speech rights outside of um, uh, clinics, mm -hmm. but to do so in a way that doesn't interfere with right. the ability of people accessing health care. And then the third bill uh, relates specifically to um, uh, centers that are masquerading as uh, medical centers yeah. and making sure that they are not permitted to give out information that is um, misleading or um, 
or otherwise uh, harmful to people who are seeking uh, access to reproductive health care. Thank you. A lot to cover there and some yeah. very important issues. I do want to make sure we get to budget priorities with a couple of minutes we have left here. Councilmember some members, I want to talk specifically about Jumpstart. I know last year more than a third of it went to the general fund for pandemic relief, which was not the original intent. Help me out with this. Are you concerned the mayor's going to lay out some other priorities again for the money coming in from Jumpstart? What's your approach to that tax revenue here in 2022? Well, I do want to correct something. Please. Actually, part of the Jumpstart spend plan for the first two years was dedicated funding for COVID relief. Right, right. So it actually was very much within uh, the, the confines of what the council had allocated, $85 million in 2021 and 2022 for helping us respond to the crisis that COVID had worsened in our community, yes. making sure that we prevent prevented against austerity budgeting and cuts to programs for our most vulnerable communities who right. needed it in the midst of the pandemic. Right. We are very, very appreciative that those payors have worked with our finance and administrative services department, the city as a whole, to comply with Jumpstart. Mm -hmm. And now we have seen higher than anticipated revenues right. for the year 2021 and higher than anticipated revenues for 2022. Uh, we know that those higher than anticipated revenues will continue for the next biennium as well. I think that the priority for council is going to be looking at the budget, making sure that the spending amounts that we codified for 2023 and 2024 are adhered to. And then if there's additional revenue that we had not projected, the higher than anticipated revenue, I want to see how we can use those dollars to prevent against austerity, to prevent against cuts. If we don't prevent against cuts and we just look at where the operational deficit currently is, we'd be looking at $141 million in that operational deficit in 2023 and over $150 million in 2024. That is unattainable. We can That is unconscionable to think about that level of cuts as we try to create a more equitable economy, as we try to house and care for people, and as we try to invest in health and safety. So my priority is going to be making sure that we're investing in the housing and the homeless services that we need in our community. Second is that we need to make sure that we are investing in an economy that works for all workers and workforce development and our local businesses. And lastly, I want to make sure that we invest in the health and, and safety of our community. And that means that mental health care, food assistance, diaper care was a big issue in the past, and this year as well, it's going to be reproductive justice as well. Yeah, I, I, Council Member Herbal, we're just about out of time, but I want to make sure I get some of your budget priorities with the minute we have left here. We're talking about a $117 million budget gap you have to fill. Let's try to do this and talk about it to round out the show. Your sure. priorities. I, I think um, for me, one of my biggest priorities is, our, is not just our city workforce, but the folks that the city contracts to provide uh, life-saving services, uh, our human services contractors. All you have to do is open up um, a paper to see the fact that um, the, f the number of people doing those jobs has decreased with the uh, great resignation, just like mm -hmm. every other job sector. And we need to figure out how we can make sure that these life-saving services are still able to be delivered um, and, and how we can make sure that there's a workforce to do it. We need to figure out how to uh, recruit and, and retain that workforce because um, it's really struggling to, to see, challenging to see that there are so many needs and, and, and services that we funded, but we don't have people out there delivering them. Okay, we're going to hear a lot about this during the budget priorities here as they get laid out over the next couple of weeks. Thank you both for joining me. We're out of time right now, but we will see you next time on Council Edition.